Three, two, one. This is 2OF Entertainment. back and live i like the way david's done that now he's like there's not like a remember before it was sort of like you knew the end was coming now the end is like boom it's done you're like okay we're here so yeah we don't want people falling asleep before they get to our show yeah i see <laughs> that i like that like you're like i'm sorry what so no but yeah we're here so canadian art today we have a very i'm excited about who we have i look at her art it's very cool um it is be fun to fun to have her art. She's getting coffee, so she's off screen right now. Oh, so we have to banter. We'll her banter until she comes yeah, back. We'll talk about her. So uh, Ro yeah, Rosemary Armstrong. We're, we're, we've got a the show today will be a little unique. We've got a a very avid, and I'll say avid, um, right. plein air plein air painter. Now a plein air painter. Yeah. Well, I'll explain that. A plein air painter is the person that drags all their art materials and everything outside and mm -hmm. paints what they see and so they follow the sun and they kind of go but they'll hike and whatever they needs to be done but they got to drag everything mm -hmm. with them so you got to condense your package down you got to make sure your panels are like she paints in oil so these things are right. wet right so you've got to figure out how are you going to do that and she's going to talk not only about her art but her process of how she plan air paints so this is a great one for people to want how do i what do i pack what colors do i take uh, what to expect, like, you know, take apples, fruit, bar, whatever you need to go sure. if you're going to go on along. This lady does, her sojourns, and I'll call them that, are right. four to six weeks long. No family wow. around by herself. Right. Into the middle of nowhere by herself. Okay. So he's got to deal with security aspects, bears, all the little things. Now, what is she searching for? Well, she is searching for illuminosity. Uh, she's a painter of atmosphere. I guess we caught, I guess, what does she paint like? She paints water and tumultuous water and storms. Uh -huh. So very much like Turner, like 18th, 1800 painter, uh, uh -huh. John Turner. You, it, when I first looked at these works, I said, where's the raft? I want to see that uh -huh. raft just flying in the nastiest storm. She was, uh, kind of raised on the coast of, uh, uh, the Great Lakes. So she's seen okay. some serious storms on Superior and Huron. And apparently she's about to have one where she is right now. She was just telling us. So, well, she is, but it won't be, well, maybe water. Yeah, that stuff doesn't freeze solid when it's moving like that. And anyway, we've got her. She's kind of a, well, maybe she's kind of a storm watcher, one of those oh. people that, that go down and they hunt storms. But anyway, she's got some very dramatic paintings and she's going to talk about how she builds those and okay. puts those together. Um, and I don't want to destroy everything. Well, we're let's gonna let's bring her in. Let's hope she's got sure. her coffee. And we'll bring her in, bring her or in. she'll be the invisible woman. Well, let's see. Ah, it's the invisible woman. In the, we're she's... waiting for Rosemary. Yeah, there there's Rosemary. There she morning. is. Morning. morning. How are you? Yes, I have my coffee. Thank you. Okay. Good. God That's forbid good. you didn't have coffee. your coffee. Yes, we didn't. We wanted to have your coffee. coffee well, there we'll be we'll be coffeeing together. So. There you go. Well, I'm going to let you two coffee together and enjoy the show. I will come after. So everybody enjoy and don't forget to subscribe and like, and uh, we'll go from there. Have a good show, guys. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, good day, Rosemary. Thank you. This is, uh, you know, I'm excited about this. And we talked quickly the other day just to make sure our connections were hooking up just right. But uh, and I'm just thinking about all these. I wish I was out doing what you do. So. I was just kind of introduced to people about plein air painting again, the excitement of going out into the landscape. Not today, because it's like really cold, but uh, I've seen people brave all kinds of weather and they have all their little devices that they have to, uh, I guess, pr procure their painting that they want to get. So we'll just kind of get into some of those things. And, uh, you know, when you're plein air painting, what are you hunting for? Like, Really, what are you looking for when you go out into that landscape? Um, I would say that depends about uh, regions. So if I'm 
uh, interior, for example, of British Columbia, I'm, I'm always looking for water. So uh, I tend to gravitate to streams, waterfalls. Uh, in fact, I, I'm a very thematic project oriented painter. So I might do a whole uh, run of waterfalls or creeks, or uh, if it's coastal, I'm looking for something else. I'm, I'm waiting for uh, the dreary days to disappear <laughs> and uh, some good wind and storms. Yeah. So yeah, I, I sense from your work, you know, it's the energy of wherever you are, like you're looking for something a little tumultuous, a little bit extreme. You're looking for things Unusual. that... Yeah. yeah, taking the mundane, taking the ordinary and using sure. the paints um, and the expression that artists have within themselves to uh, <coughs> turn it into something that isn't ordinary. And uh, I've been accused multiple times <laughs> due to my presence in a public studio for 10 years old and before that often in public. Uh, so I'm on the road, which is sometimes public and also painting in public. Uh, I, I find people are noticing uh, the tumult tumultuous feeling that comes through the atmosphere when it's very windy and stormy and I know my clouds so if you get lucky enough to get a cumulonimbus cloud uh, that's pretty exciting but because I'm a painter of light and I know you mentioned Turner yesterday briefly uh, he's sort of my idol not as a person necessarily but the way he captured and expressed what he he saw and experienced um, I love what he's done with his colors. I love what he's done with his dark against light, all the contrasts in the work. Uh, and so as a result, when people say, wow, you, you paint very darkly, I, my answer is I, I'm painting what I see or perhaps embellishing that somewhat, but without the darkness, how can I show the light? How can I show the streams of light coming out of the sky, you know, when the sky opens up and the clouds pass briefly during the storm, I'm not capturing that unless I have the backdrop, the contrast. So uh, people are kind of interested in that conversation because they haven't really looked at it often in, in that manner. Uh, the same with water. You know, if you look at water, it's very complex. It never stops moving. I love the challenge of painting it. But without, you know, all the lower parts of the the water moving, you're not getting the crest. You need one for the other. Yeah, I find Does that, that a lot of time, yeah. Well, I answered my question. It's an open question, but I think yes. understanding that a lot of people, you know, they uh, they turn tail and, and run when they see a storm or, or when, the, when the waves are, huge waves are crashing on the beach, they kind of say, well, I'm not going to walk on the beach, but you send, you tend to put them there. Right. That's your work. Your work, your work kind of puts them in front of those scenes that they kind of wish they were there, but they turned tail and ran a little bit. So I, I oh, feel and that some people, love it. some people love it. People who are in the Marines, people who sail sailboats, oh, even yeah. though I'm not painting sailboats very often, um, they get it. I once yeah. did a storm called, um, what was it? Uh, something about illumination and, um, and it was very red, the sea, and yellow sky, and this huge tidal wave. And the birds, you know, of course, when you have a huge wave like that, they're just waiting for the krill to come up, right? And I was showing it down in Niagara Falls. And a gentleman said, I love that painting. I saw it here last year. Oh, there it is. And I, I said, I know it's a, it's a rather um, exaggerated version he said oh no it's not I, i've been in ways like that <laughs> and he was an uh, avid sailor yeah. so uh yeah. it actually happens and yes people run away from that kind of thing it's hard to paint i can rarely paint in that environment uh right. so i have to sketch i have to photograph but i can't work from photographs so it ends up often sitting in my car or if it's not too bad um putting up the hatchback um <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult, but uh, you know. That being said, I'm I'm not always moving. There are places, for example, um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island, where I'll hole up for four or five days in a little cabin, and I yeah. can yeah. have lots of experiences on the shore that turn yeah. into paintings. No, mm -hmm. that's, and I think that's experiences is what we're talking about. I mean, it's really how do you 
adjust? How do you adjust to different environments? I'm going to actually just start. We'll just start the first painting here and just get our we'll talk and then we'll just go through some of this stuff here. So, so you mentioned that. Are, are, is this actually a place or is it a number of places or? No. How do you? Um, yeah, it's. I've got it here behind me. It's drawing, so it'll be ready to varnish uh, for an event. Um, so how do you build? How do you? Build? How do I build it? Well, it, it's from a sketchbook, which comes from multiple studies, which come from oh. multiple locations where I've painted. If you were sitting right now in my public studio called Dragonfly Arts on Broadway, you would see a little painting five by seven, with that peninsula in the background. And that peninsula is on the north coast of Lake Spear near Rossport Beach. Uh, if you were in that studio, you'd see another painting of these waves, which is a combination of waves, uh, probably near Port Renfrew. I mean, waves are waves, right? But um, it more expresses the, the coastline that I've seen on the west coast more frequently. The yeah. dunes are from Oregon because uh, in 2023, uh, I did a almost six week uh, journey from Michigan to Colorado and up the West Coast. And in Oregon, I was invited to stay with a collector whose house sits, uh, well, the viewpoint would be close to those dunes. And so we walked the shore and I painted on the shore and I love the dunes. I mean, they're such a nice contrast and the color is not a lie. That's burnt sienna with a little bit of magenta and yellow ochre. That's what it looked like to me. So the, that's how I constructed it then. So I have multiple paintings of these components in this big painting. So what happens after I'm back, I'm finishing the work from the road, which could be 24 paintings, 30 paintings. They're all small to medium size and they're almost always on a panel. I like to work on the panel uh, up to about size 12 by 16, then I need to cradle it later. but because uh, I don't want any warp. And so I finished those in the studio and then I start to speculate. And it's almost like you're infused with certain aspects of the experience on the road um, and by certain paintings that came out of that experience uh, that are more favorite. And they find their way into the next big painting. And so right now it's February and all through the fall, uh, and winter now, I'm building these large paintings, and they all are coming from a sketch. Uh, and often I will, in my book, color the sketch to get a sense of the palette I want. Uh, but they're almost always multiple places. Yeah. So do you do you have a kind of a minimal palette that you work with when you go plein air painting? Very. And then when I teach, uh, I, I try to um, help people find a palette that they love because part of having a personal palette, a favorite palette is it helps to identify your work, uh, not just the subject matter, right? So uh, my favorite palette, it always will be uh, titanium white, no other white. I love uh, that it stays white. I love that uh, it's very opaque. Um, I am a painter that uses ivory black. But that being said, I pull in ultramarine blue and Prussian blue. So there's my warm and cool blues. So it's not really ivory black when I'm, you know, when I'm glazing to get shadow and, and so on. It's not with black. Um, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red medium, magenta. So then depending on the palette I want, I massage that. Uh, I, I don't use the complementary colors, so I, I don't have orange, I don't have purple, I don't have green on my palette. Those all come from the other right. um, primary mm -hmm. colors. Yeah. It keeps it simple when I'm on the road. That's all I need in my posh aid box. I but I might throw in a rose, you know, or a rose matter or quinacridone red or I don't like cobalt that much. Cerulean often, you'll see in this painting, there's lots of cerulean blue. I always notice there's a quality difference in cerulean. Uh, it's one of those things you think you're buying the right color and it's not the same cerulean. So I kind of stayed away from it, but you, you almost well, need it's to test amazing. It. Yeah. 
Well, it's for, amazing. For, yeah. Yeah. It's May I say for, something about that point? Because uh, I think that's a very valid point. And with the, the pace at which product is changing, it's amazing. Um, you know, they're changing to synthetic. The, the pigment itself is different. It's not natural. Um, I was doing a series of 10 paintings, nine 12 by 12s, leading up to the, like, sort of like this idea, a 36 by 36. And I got to about the fifth painting using a, one company, Cerulean, I won't say the company's name. And that was fine. And then at that point, I needed more. And I came across, I'm going to say it now, Cobra by Royal Talents. And I opened the tube and I continued to work. And I didn't even notice a difference. And someone coming through the public studio said, why are these paintings different than those ones? And I looked and I looked and I realized the blue was different. It was crisper. It was richer, bluer. And, you know, it's a big difference when you start to add titanium white to, to tint your, your color. It, it takes on another life. Uh, so I think that's very relevant too. Yeah, and, and I've also discovered that a Prussian blue, for example, from one company might be a transparent rating. Well, another company's Prussian blue is totally opaque. So uh, I'm still in the process of educating myself. I think that's a lifelong <laughs> pursuit because of the changing product. Well, but, uh, yeah. It's part of the I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be in real trouble because years ago I was befriended a lot of old oil paint in original tubes from the mid 60s early 70s it's like it's beautiful it's great to work with but when I run out of that then I'm gonna run into some problems call me <laughs> trying call to, me try, trying to match up the paints but you know in in what I do but Maybe I have a life's work. I, I, I got a lot of this paint, so I, I was able to buy it up. Uh, but yeah, I that, advise people great. that, yeah, well, there are opportunities with aging uh, artists as well that are trying to downsize and get rid of a lot of their product. A lot of these people have, they have a lot of paint and different resources that they've been using for years and they want to sell it. And so keep your ear to the ground and, you know, you can acquire some of those things. I still have titanium white as well from the mid 60s. It's pretty amazing. Anyway, I think there's even mm. some lead white. Good Lord. <laughs> Don't lick my well, brushes. I've given a lot away as well. <clears throat> yeah. I'd like to say that my mom passed away many years ago. She was a, a beautiful oil painter of the finest order, uh, Czechoslovakian, German uh, background. Uh, and she would paint, you know, the, the great masterpieces with Pontius Pilate or the Sphinxes of Egypt and always in oil. And when she passed away, the family said, here you go. Well, to that day, I was, I'd never touched oil because <clears throat> um, I didn't want to compete because I knew I couldn't uh, compete with what she, she did. But I was all mixed media and acrylic. And all of a sudden, one day, I looked at the oils and I thought, how do I, what do I do with these things? So that was about 17 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I started by... Um, mixing glazes and putting them over my acrylic paintings. And I discovered how wonderfully uh, rich they were uh, and how I could make tonal differences in the painting. And then more and more, the acrylic disappeared from my palette and it was oil, but traditional oil. And then I became yeah. ill and I had to go on a, a path of discovering how to make myself healthier. And that's when I began the exploration into the caustic elements of paint and the mediums. Uh, and I left the linseed oil and the turps behind and pushed away those paints and I went into the water mixable. But that being said, I, I sometimes need to incorporate the other kind of oil, the traditional oil. And just because of the particular pigment <clears throat> to get what I want. And so they're not, ex they're not totally gone from my palette. But the thing is that when you mix oil with water mixable, paints, you're no longer having the benefits of the cleanup. So I'm waiting for Royal Talons to send me some samples to use with myself and my students, which apparently if you add to the 
Cobra traditional oil mixture makes it still water soluble and water cleanup. Yeah, mine so is that's an interesting new yeah. development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was always confusing to me, the water-based oil paints. But it's, Not at uh, all. I like to put a plug in for them because they are uh, much easier on the body. Yeah. Well, you're plain air painting, you know, it's not so bad. You're outside and it's fresh air. And uh, if you're in a studio, it's best to have a little air exchanger or something to help freshen yes. the air in your, in your studio. So that's definitely to talk about the health aspects of that. So these are this is a earlier piece, I guess we'll call. Um, this is Here not is. stormy. This is not stormy water and stuff. We'll get a couple of those. So, nope. you know, we're talking about those titanium whites and, you know, you're bringing that in. A lot of times snow is not really white. You know, it's it's a version no, it's of, of grays and mixing your grays and, and trying to get that, I guess, that luminosity of the day, you know, and you're trying to capture it. So was this one just a sketch and then you work up from that? No, photograph? no, no. This is uh, my backyard, actually. And it's that's one of the earliest. And it's so it is totally acrylic <clears throat> paint. Um, okay. And it's my backyard on an old Ontario farm property that... Uh, uh, harkens back to the 1800s and we've been here 30 years so a lot of my plein air painting in those earlier years started right here on site yeah yeah and it's i have <laughs> oh people so we'll would love about, it we'll talk about that that we'll get into some of the, the sojourns that you've gone on to uh you know four and six week journeys i mean my goodness you know uh i just think myself to go out for that long a period of time there's a commitment to that in, in a major way, you know, here's a, another, another one here. Um, like, so is this you'll see part these of the are more topical, right? Paul, these yeah. are more topical. They have uh, subjects. Pale, this is maple uh, syrup. Maple, is this maple syrup? It is. Yeah, maple syrup. Collection. Locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a big painting. That I... Yeah. I can see the pail hanging on the tree and the axe. And these feel very Vermonty like the, you know, you see a lot of these uh, nor, uh, Northern American painters that paint that East Northeast area, you know, uh, there's always a pheasant in there and a bunch of other little things. Thank goodness you didn't do that. You've got a, but just a nice wood lot, this beautiful breakup of light and dark. I'll just, you know, I've always. Thank you. Kind of snap. Um, I think. The contrast is important, you know, and there's a nice depth within your, um, you know, the, the ochres, the sienas, the sienas, the darks in, in the leaf structure that's in the foreground there. It's just, it's it's a pleasing painting, right? But, I think it was uh, around 2007 hmm. or eight I did that one. So that's quite a while ago. <clears throat> yeah. Te um, well, we're, artists are always we're, transforming. We're, we're, so. Um, if I might say about that other piece with the axe, when artists are developing over a period uh, of decades, it's not just the paints they use and the style that they have that's, that's developing, but uh, their subject matter. So there was a good 10 year period that everything was subject oriented, old trucks, old cars, old barns, this kind of mm -hmm. thing. But then I felt I needed a bigger challenge. And it's pretty hard to paint atmosphere and water because they never stay constant. They're not, they're, they're moving. And, and so that's a huge challenge for me and I love it. And that's why I haven't been painting like this. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about this moving water. This beautiful. There's this, there's this electricity power that's, that's going through this front end and this, you know, the falls. And yeah, I've seen lots of, like lots of paintings of water and waterfalls and trees and rocks and things. And a lot of them are just gorgeous, beautiful paintings. You want to be there. You want to put your feet in the water. You want to catch a trout. You want to do when you see these paintings. And this painting, it evokes different things in me. You know, there, there's, there's a little deeper for some reason. It, it feels... Uh, this water is really moving and it's really it's going places and there, there's something i don't know there's a little dark edge about it somewhere there's something yes it's deep and it's moving fast but the details there but it's not there which that's that atmosphere right and we're talking about well said. thank you yeah well, I, I mean i appreciate that i mean we are dealing with darks and lights you got the greens in the top and a little deeper rich and i'll say they're not just dark they're rich colors i mean 
you know, the lights bouncing on the top, yet you can see the bottom of the, the river. And I think a lot of people, how do you draw a rock that's not still? Like it's the water's rushing over it, so it's blurred. So you're blurring images without muddy paint, right? It's difficult. Well, this, and these are these are these are things you have to learn. This is why uh, when I said earlier, painting on the road is one thing, but if you're gone a long time, you're cycling through the paintings. You might have some time in the evening or the morning waiting for everyone to get off the road or whatever. Uh, reason where you just go and spend a little time with these paintings that are, you know, I mean, it's oil, so but it's at least tacky now, and I can glaze over it. So, you know, mm -hmm. I might take two or three out and do some glazing to get the depth. So that's glazing uh, of the water over the rocks that are already partially dry. <clears throat> it's not happening that first day. Um, I'm placing the water with titanium white but all these shades of green in the water, orange, that comes later, right? And, and you can see some veils in here as well. Um, it's a process. Some of these paintings take a long time uh, to get to the end of. So you might have, some people will say, oh, that's already done. And I, I know it's not because I haven't gone through my process, which is yeah. the, the construct uh, and then the shadows and light and glazing. And then when that's done, then I go with the tiny brushes, which is why I like a very smooth surface like Clayboard by Ampersand. Uh, allows me to take those tiny brushes and that's what you see in the water that's creating the movement. Um, yeah. So that takes some time to do that. Uh, but that's a very magical place in Ontario that uh, will soon become part of the Bruce Trail. So oh, not many nice. people get to see it. Yeah. No, that's and that's the nice thing about these these pieces. When you somebody purchases that piece, that that's in their home. They can go there every day and visit that. That's the nice thing about um, building uh, an art collection, where you can say, I can relate to certain areas. Maybe there's an area you've never been before, or maybe it's a remembrance. I guess sometimes, but it's remembered at a stage maybe that you were never aware of. Maybe the ice just broke up or something like that, but. It evokes, um, I guess, that heartfelt dream within a buyer that they want more. You know, the collectors that have more than one of your works, right? Why did they do that? They, you, the collectors you are wondering. Them. They're not only yeah. enjoying the paintings, they're following my path. So some right. collectors are covering 20 years of collecting. Uh, I, I have some that have 15, 16, 17 paintings. That's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> or the average is about four or five. Uh, and they're often choosing on a theme, like they're choosing my mountains from Alberta and BC, or they're cho uh, choosing Lake Superior uh, regions um, or river themes. But I, I love my collectors. I'm very personal with some of them. It's just like the dunes of Oregon I shared. I stayed with those people. And I have these invitations uh, because I meet people on the road and in the studio. And I find it really exciting when a person will come by and say, hmm, is that Moraine Lake? Indeed, it is. Oh, is that, uh, is that the, uh, the flats, the canal flats? Uh, yes, it is, indeed. And they recognize it, and these people come from all over to buy something in Ontario and go home with something from home. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, that's where it kind of starts. And then once a collector trusts you, they can, they can reach out past say something that they don't know but usually they, they try to find a connection uh in your work or you try to find a connection with a, maybe a potential buyer um, or something or a new collector anyway to the right you see this pile of panels and cardboard and yeah oh, there's pictures goodness. of you and a very bright <laughs> outfit above it yeah. uh can you, can you, okay so we're talking about plein air painting trekking out in the woods uh, transporting wet panels. Can you, can you go through a little bit of your, I guess your process of setting up a planning a trip a little bit. Um, let's just say, say you're, you're going into the outback for a few days. How do you, how do you transport all this stuff? Like how do you, how do you, how do you move yes. about? And I guess I'm just saying, We've got, these panels, we've got these panels stacked on the right here. So what is what is this 
Oh, okay, well, first off, you're not seeing the big ones. You're not seeing the larger ones. So I'll, no. I'll carry up to 12 by 24, that's cradled, <clears throat> and 18 by 24. That's about the biggest size I can fit in my car. But the first thing is I'm not going out. I'm not one of the painters that's going out. I'm 67 years old. I don't mind saying that. I'm pretty fit, uh, but I'm alone. So I am not going off too far into the bush by myself. If uh, my husband joins me for a section of a road trip, or in the past, my daughter would meet me, say, in Edmonton and, and run the mountains with me, and she'd be my, she'd be my security, <laughs> uh, then it's a little up. different. I can go a little farther. Um, but uh, otherwise, my car is my mainstay. So this has to fit along, not just with the... Um, the paint uh, supplies and materials, but I have to consider my personal needs. I need a, a first aid kit. I need um, a sleeping bag because I don't always know where I'm going to end up. I, I don't have it pre-planned. I don't know. I, I can't say I'm going to be in Portage La Prairie tonight uh, or Drumheller. I have no idea. You know, one time I was in the West Grasslands painting bison and then I left and I was near Swift Current and I saw an ad for bison ranch way up in Slave Lake, Lesser Slave, called them up, said, I'll trade you a painting for some lodging, and off I went. So <laughs> I have to be prepared. Uh, I need my pillow. I need my vitamins and any meds if I have them. Um, good hiking boots, more than one pair, socks, laundry soap. I mean, the list goes on, but as far as the paints go, uh, you'll see in the other photo above, I'm working on a little metal easel. It's because it was really rugged to get into that. That was Cap, yeah, Cap Kigawan um, River Waterfall, Cap Kigawan Park, the smallest provincial park in Ontario. Uh, so it was a kind of rough. I didn't take my poche box, so I just had the easel and a backpack. And it was very rainy too, so I, um, that was one of the factors. But normally I have a poche box. I don't think you can see it's behind me. <clears throat> And everything fits inside of it and has a strap that goes, you know, over my shoulder. It keeps my hands free. Uh, when I get back to the car, you'll see I have little tabs on those clay boards. Uh, that keeps me from getting my hands dirty with wet oil paint because it's going to be wet for days. So I can pull them out, set them up on my, my easel on the posh aid box, work away, put them back. Um, on the posh aid box, I have industrial Velcro on the outside. Paul, can I bring it over and show people? I think it would help. Oh, sure. Yeah. All righty. Hang on one sec. Yeah. <clears throat> Plus, uh, you ask about transporting. It's all fine and dandy to make art, but my goodness, if you uh, have to transport, that's another story. So, can you see that posh aid box? Yeah, just come a little closer. There you go. Yeah. All yeah. right. So... Uh, I'll lift it up because that's as high as it goes, and I'll turn it. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, one moment, I'll take that out of it. I am not outside painting in the winter. I'm a spring, summer, fall. Okay, yep. so you can see this is where the paints go, uh, and brushes and whatever else. I'll lift it up again. Uh, or you can put them in the bottom where I've stored them for now. And here, this is really handy for artists to know. You can't really see it, but that's Velcro. Oh, okay. Right here. Now the back of the clay board has a little piece of Velcro and I stick it on there when it's time to close this up and hike out. Good. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. No, and that way I you can hold all can hold all different sizes too. Not you don't have to work with a predetermined slide in section. No, or, and if I want a larger one, I also have a velcro on the opposite side. So cross your fingers and hope it's not pouring rain. You can actually carry two wet ones out. Yeah. A third one if you're trying to carry it, but if you're on slippery rocks, that's not the smartest idea. Yeah, it's hard enough carrying that uh, easel like that you know, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really important to be safe, uh, no matter where you are. Um, yeah. It's easy to work out of the back of the car. 
you know, I'm not, but I'm not that kind of plein air painter that's going to drive off for a few hours one afternoon and paint. Uh, I might set a day and I might take some students and we'll go paint a garden somewhere. Um, so that's, that's more uncommon. I prefer five days, 10 days, go into Northern Ontario, New Lisker, uh, Cochrane, uh, head over into the Quebec side, um, or just get on the road because that's, I just leave everything away. It's gone. So it's you, only you get, out, you get out to your driveway and you say, "Am I going to turn left or am I going to turn right?" <laughs> I, uh, I, I love it. not quite that. It seems like you can uh, stop and start, and if you want to extend, you extend your trip, or you like you have a looser. You're not pre-planning. I have to be here on this day no. uh, for it's, camping. You know, such or, a blessing. Yeah, no, it's such a blessing. A there's a freedom to that, that uh, I think, I think artists need to be, a, I guess I'll call it, they need to be a little selfish with their time. If we're so giving of our time to social, social painting or groups that you're part of, or things that you're committed to, if you don't, and I'll call it, you have to take and steal the time for yourself to discover what you like. Yeah, otherwise, if you're just painting in a group, that's great for a social outing for once a week or whatever you want to do, have coffee and paint a nice painting or do something or discuss things. But I think if you're really serious about what you're doing, you need to take the time, uh, I guess, in a selfish manner. Uh, it's hard to say that out loud, but it's true. You know, I think you have to be um, you, ha you have to take your time yourself. You just have to be selfish. Is that is that is that something? that you could say as well yourself a little bit your husband well, your I husband seems feel very like giving selfish. i feel i'm absolving my responsibilities sometimes <laughs> and i have a lovely <laughs> granddaughter who lives near here and and you know sometimes she'll facetime and say are you coming home and uh, <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile i've got another family on the west coast who are saying do you have to leave you know and i'm touching base with them but yes those days hours weeks on the road often with little interaction other than incidental interaction you know checking into a motel talking to people at a campsite you know sitting on the back of your car with a bunch of other people crossing canada and you're sitting in winnie the pooh park in white river because there's no place to sleep you know i mean those are incidental but otherwise you're alone um that being said, yeah, randomly people will show up in the middle of nowhere, which is shocking to me. But um, and there you are with your easel, and all of a sudden there's a group of motorcycles lined up and saying, "What are you doing?" <laughs> you know, yeah, I always like, I always like the motorcycles are always. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's it's funny, but uh, I cherish that time by myself. But I would say every professional artist is going to say the number one way to get better is brush time. So that brush time is every single second that I am interacting uh, with what's around me yeah. um, on a canvas. And I, I'm not thinking of anything else. So if that's selfish, I don't think it is. I think it's being professional. It's, it's, it's studying, it's learning. And uh, I don't imagine a time where I, I wouldn't be doing that. I mean, I haven't always done long hauls, I call them. Um, often I've flown in and rented a car and, and gone for, you know, every little back road of, um, Athabasca re region, for example, and really studied an area. And I like doing that as well. Yeah. But, but um, it, you get immersed, you get really immersed in an area. It's nice. You could never paint it all, but you, you have to. Uh, absorb it and I think you just have to allow yourself the time and it's great that you have a husband and family that that respect that that they go along with you a little bit on somebody makes sure it's safe but it's kind of let you do your thing right and uh it, part, it's, of, it, yeah. it's a part of it is branding right some people uh some artists uh paint everything uh, people that I mentor I try to narrow them down a little to what they're good at but what they need to learn at uh, but not everything, a still life, a dog, a mountain. Uh, you know, if they want to step out professionally, you kind of need to say something 
about what yeah. you're doing. And for me, is I love being Canadian. I'm a European background, Swiss, Czech, German, you may, you name it, um, a mixed hound, so to speak. But I'm Canadian, and I'm really proud of it. And this is a majestic country, and I just want to experience as much as I can of it and let other people experience it as well. And yeah. I'm blessed to be able to do it this way, but it's on purpose. That's why I'm so traveling. It's, so it's really nice with your palette because it's really tough when you start painting Northern Ontario in the fall and the cliche group of seven palette comes out, right? And yet your still taste stays truer to your palette, you know? <clears throat> so it doesn't look like a Thompson painting or, or Jackson painting. Uh, so it's kind of like, it's a tough thing for an artist to do. And I think you talk about that limited palette uh, deciding what to do, focusing on what you want to, because landscape painting, we all have a personal, what we like. I mean, you can follow other right, painters, but how do you find your own vision? And mm -hmm. how do you find your own voice in the way you paint and see the country? And I think you've done it miraculous. I think water is really uh, a big piece. This is a beautiful painting. It's got a lot of, a lot of energy in this piece. And, uh, you know, there's that, just that glow of daylight smacking you back there behind the, the beginning of the creek or the river that's coming in there. So really, yet it's not a hole. It's not a, it's not a, a white hole in your work where a lot of times the people will put that sun burst that's in the between. It becomes a hole in their painting uh, of white. And this is... This is more so than that. This is. You won't this is see that, that in my paintings. I, I can't do it. <laughs> well, it's that atmosphere that we're talking about, the luminosity of light. But uh, again, the water's got that nice electrical edge thing. There's, there's stuff. It's moving, and I can almost see fish. You know, in BC, oh, you can see the salmon that are running. You know, it almost has that feeling. Oh. In the water. That would be a beautiful thing to paint. Hard, but. Hard, okay, yeah. this is yeah, this this is getting to those I don't want to be on the water with my little boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, do you know the title of this one, Paul? Yeah. Is this it's the called Edmund Revelation. Revelation. Oh, Revelation. Revelation. I was thinking the Edmund Fitzgerald and it's gonna be at the bottom of Lake <laughs> Huron. <laughs> There's no particular place. Yeah, it's no, it's it's very Turner-esque, and that's not that's that's a compliment. That's and it. I mean, Turner was a a realistic painter, but he was more he was an abstract painter, really. And uh, if you look closer at his works, and you know, it was capturing that atmosphere and light. And I think this piece really evokes a lot of tension. You know, there's got a lot of yeah, and you've got a yeah. There's a dark, dirty cloud there on that one side, but. You really know there's something happening in the middle there is you know it's uh, there's some weather happening so were you you were raised as a child on the on uh lake superior or here uh, no only no not lake superior lake huron port elgin southampton uh sobble i was born there and lived there till we were i was six and then my family moved uh east towards toronto um but that being said, anyone we knew was in Port Elgin. And um, so all my life till I was probably 17, we spent most of the summer there and uh, yeah. at the beach at my, my aunts, my other aunts, my uncles. Uh, and my dad worked and my mom took the whole brood of us, four of us, and off we went. And sometimes just in a tent trailer, sometimes we'd get a cabin. And so summers were spent uh there this is you know more of a mature experience though i wouldn't hearken back to those early days uh, this is more of the european in me coming out um pacific ocean i did my fair share of uh work in new brunswick and nova scotia as well um that's a that's an angry sea but it's beautiful to me because of the light and as I yeah. said earlier, you, you can't bring the light out without the dark. And and this particular painting was a 
um, a big step for me because it was accepted to Best of America in 2016, and uh, only three Canadians showed there, and that was in uh, Orleans, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, and and funny funny about that because this was the painting in the show. It's it's 30 by 30, and then when it was time to leave and take the painting with us and go back to Ontario from Massachusetts on, it's on Cape Cod. Uh, there is a huge weather watch and a hurricane can't tell you which, what the name of the hurricane was, but it came in and we tried to get out and we sat on, uh, the highway just along with all the other vehicles at the bridge that leaves from, I'm going to say Falmouth up and across to the mainland. Uh, we couldn't leave. Uh, so we just drove around and, and that day I was out in the storm. We watched the radio newscasters with their vans all along the waterfront. Uh, we saw surfers going out in this hurricane. Uh, and there I had that painting in the back of the, the car and I was like, wow, <laughs> that's exactly, you know, what I'm seeing here. So it's nice to experience things to say there's a reality here. I painted reality. And, you know, things mm -hmm. do come about that. A lot of us aren't brave enough to do this. A lot of us just want to, they just want to paint that one painting that somebody was, wants to buy. And, you know, and just to paint too many of those, one right after the other. And you say, well, this is a huge challenge, you know. And, you know, it may never sell. It doesn't matter. It's like, have you really painted for yourself, right? So do you, mm -hmm. is that the way you usually paint? Paint for yourself first? Always. Uh, Always. I've, I have many colleagues I've seen over the years, and they're moving with the wind, the market. Uh, so if figurative work is in an abstract form, that's what they're doing. Next thing I know, they're doing landscapes and oil. Whatever the market is bearing, whatever they can sell, and that's fine. That I call that, maybe I'm wrong, more commercial approach. I want to be traditional. I have a European flair in it. I love the old masters. I love... Moran, I, I love uh, Turner, um, uh, Repin. I think it's part of my nature and my upbringing to gravitate to those kinds of works. Uh, and because they're so big. And it's like when you look at this one called Andantino, uh, Moderate in Tempo. Um, I like to sometimes use other languages for titles. And to me, it's continuous. I can walk out there to that water. I can turn right at the end of that dune and I can just keep going. Right. And the sky is sweeping over and it's going on. So I'm seeing more than what I put on the painting. Yeah. So, yeah. It's tough when you're, when you're painting plein air, your vision is really wide and you need to focus. What is the most important thing that I'm, why did I stop here? I, I've always tried to make sure I kind of answer that question. It's really hard. Your eye sees everything, but really, what are you looking at? And I know a lot of artists get confused and they try to, they get the wrong shape palette or uh, canvas in front of them or board. It's, you know, it's a horizontal vision and they're looking vertical or all they've got is a, a four by five panel and they need something longer for a vista. What are you, what are you painting? So how do you, what do you use? Do you have a cropping device you use or anything for figuring out what sections you like? Or do you no. just, just sketch? Well, you sketch I've been doing things? this for 52 years. I can shut it out. I can just focus on what I, I need. This is a studio painting, so I think this is what's important. There were 10 Andantinos. There were 10 of this location. The biggest one is 36 or 40 by 60, and it's in right. the other room of my private studio here. There were many came before this. So this is studio painting. The other smaller ones, also called Andantino 1, Andantino 2, Huron Shores 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, they have the big sky. They have the same location at Inverse Huron, Ontario, on the shores of Lake Huron, where I grew up. Uh, so this is a very personal painting for me. And uh, it was funny because I showed it at McMichael Gallery. Uh, the one time I showed in their uh, fall fundraiser, and McMichael's well known for the group of seven that you mentioned, uh, and a gentleman named Andy walked up to it and said, oh my goodness, I need that. <laughs> and I don't know where he grew up, but I'm, I'm happy that it made someone happy.
I'm glad he needed that. So oh. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> look like you're a storm, you're a storm chaser. I think that's really what I am so. <laughs> Can I tell that's you what, this a brief story of this one? Yeah, well, you told me, but not everybody else about this one. Ah. This one has a very Saskatchewan feel. Yeah. Well, I, I'm on my Mac right now in this interview, and right behind the screen that's up with you and I for the interview, my desktop is that same spot, and it shows a barn flying off into the distance. Well, I don't think I put that in the painting. The barn's still <laughs> on the ground. So now this is a little bit close to your home base. Uh, so this was 2019, and uh, I didn't have a lot of cell phone service for some reason, and I was on my way west. To, no, I was east to west that time. And um, my husband called and said, where are you? I said, I'm in Saskatchewan. Like, I don't really know. I'm on a side road. <laughs> he said, well, stay, stay away from Regina and Saskatoon. There's tornado activity up that way. I said, I know the sky's looking pretty rough. Uh, okay, have a safe day. Love you, honey. <laughs> Hung up. I went, hmm, okay, which way should I go? So I went farther <laughs> towards it, but skirting it, because I want to make sure that I'm in a, not in a danger zone. But, you know, the atmosphere is very turbulent. It's always changing. I stopped. I started painting this. And uh, all of a sudden, I was so cold. I ran to the front of the Mazda, turned it on, and it was 18 degrees. I said, oh, my goodness. And that's yeah. when I saw these funnel yeah. clouds forming. And I said, uh, time to go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I went up a little later. Nothing like a prairie yeah. storm rolling up, yeah, for sure, and then My throw goodness, a little I tornado on top of it all. Yeah, such an appreciation for the prairie. Well, we'll get you back to the water here, and we're as we're closing uh, up. Here. This is again a beautiful light. I mean, I I almost want to go to church on this one, but not quite. I'm just ready to go, and it has that. It has that very. I don't know. There's the heavens, you know. It's it, there's a, and. Uh, the light on the water is, is uh, it, it, it's again hard to, you know, the streaking of light is really a, a challenge for a lot of artists um, to do it not too dark, not too light, but it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, I think people just need to appreciate the subtleness of it because everybody's seen that flaring of light that comes through clouds occasionally and it's like putting rainbows and lightning in. It's, it's a tough thing to do well and believably. So uh, I kind of, it's still very Turner-esque as well. So I do, I it's do the greatest, that. grandest compliment when people say something like it's very Turner-esque or it's very spiritual, it's very moving. There's oh, look at the light. Right. Yeah. That I'm, then I'm doing the job I want to do. But I have to say, so much is from memory. These are not from photographs. They're from experiences, memory, feeling. That's the best work. Great music. Best great work music. Is from memory. Yeah. Yeah. I've Rahman. always been an artist that if you're working from a photo, turn it upside down and now do your painting. Because your mind will only remember what it wants to remember from that image. But don't turn the picture back up. You, you paint from that. There's well, a there time and a place another off. another vertical rolling waterscape. I mean, this again, the gulls are there. They're waiting for the the heron and the fish to pop up. But it's a beautiful piece. I think you need that that cerulean that's in there. To, you know, with the whites and uh, yeah, that little skip of light on the water. I mean, you can see that ridge of that wave that's building. It's just, it's just that it's, it's got a really nice feeling. Uh, but again, these pieces are maybe uncomfortable for some people, you know, a little bit. You know, they, you know, they, they look at them. That's nice. Paul. Yeah. Paul, can I say one more thing? You sure can. A moment. When you say it can be disturbing for some people, I want it to be disturbing. Because one of the do. things, <laughs> one of one of the most important things about my pieces, when I express like this, and I'm painting to music, and I'm thinking about the world, and it's a tough spot for a lot of people. But our environment, uh, I get to be in the environment, and I get to appreciate the beauty of it. But I'm 
absolutely cognizant of what we're doing as a species. And as an artist for conservation, I have to say, follow artists for conservation. You've got 500 artists that are trying to express something. And I'm saying this is the calm before the storm, or this is a storm that's here and you're getting a break. Whatever people take from it, I use it as an opportunity to talk about those matters, climate change, uh, pollution of our waters. We haven't done that much here because uh, that my thing. Um, but if you're interested in how artists use their art for conservation causes, please, everyone, check out Artists for Conservation. Yeah, there, I get Stephen, maybe we can find that link and we can add that yeah. to our thing, Artists for Conservation. We can do anything. It's the magic of it's the magic of YouTube. So we're good. Well, the paintings are absolutely gorgeous. So my question I always ask everybody, what do your paintings go for? From what to what? The range. Ah, Somebody wants to buy one. The range. They paint a lot of little ones, as you now know, and those are the road trippers. And those ones will go from $150 framed. I'm a custom framer too, so it's a good frame. Okay. Uh, to the small ones, I call them miniatures on my website, uh, okay. six by six and up to eight by ten. Uh, it's about you know 150 to 400 dollars. A great okay. big studio piece, 40 by 60. You're looking at six, seven thousand dollars. So I'm not at the upper echelons. Uh, my point is to move paintings into people's spaces. Okay. I don't need to make a huge amount of money. I need to cover my costs of travel. <laughs> that's the, that's the key. We'll have the we'll have your website below. So anybody that wants to buy, I've looked at your website where you guys were talking. Everything's absolutely gorgeous. And the one that you said that was disturbing, Paul, we may have to buy that and just send that to David since David's already <laughs> disturbing. We'll get him all so, so, Let so me put a plug in for, for Dale Shaw then, because Dale Shaw is a wonderful person who I met because I saw a Robert Ginn painting in her window. She in Oak Bay, Victoria, on Vancouver Island. She hosts my work now for many years. She has that painting you're talking about. It's called Portal. Okay. Portal. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Good to know. All right, it David, is if you're watching and listening, which you should be because, you know, that's your job, then you know, you know what your gift this is for Monica. So there you go. So something disturbing. Thanks for the yeah. opportunity. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Thank you for being on the show. Your stuff is absolutely gorgeous and wonderful. Um, and we hope you find a whole new audience with it. Yeah. Yeah. We will, oh, well, we, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. We may we may have you back for some other things as well. We've been talking about some other things. We might do some. Have to trigger today, uh, Stephen, into what we're gonna plan, but maybe we'll get something back here again. I mean, Happy to our, help your shows no yeah well you just have a great road trip this year and uh wherever it be keep us in mm. touch yeah we i know where that. it will be going <laughs> south to north carolina All right. there you go yeah go back yeah, they got, the thank you for, yeah they got Very some cool. storms coming i can predict that there you go <laughs> so everybody thank you for thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe and like all the links for Rosemary will be below. You can find her and go that route. And if you like something, purchase it. Remember, it's in Canadian dollars, so it's like $4 US. So Absolutely. It's very easy. There you go. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you all next Thursday. Cheers. See you next week. Okay. Bye.